Hello, BookTube and Twitter writing community. My name is Tom, and in this week's episode of Limited Unlimited, I'll be going over Brooke Allen's Antonius, Son of Rome, the first book in the Antonius series. I don't have a lot of experience reading historical fiction, so take my review with a grain of salt. Um, so let's get into it. All right, so as usual, the first thing that I really want to point out is that the book cover is very nicely done. Even though I don't have a lot of experience reading historical fiction and I'm not super well-versed in Roman history, I thought that this book was really interesting. The first chapter immediately immerses you into the Roman culture in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming. It's really difficult to immerse a reader in your world, especially in the first chapter, without doing an exposition info dump. And I think Alan does a really good job in this first chapter because everything that we learn about the world and about the culture is all through Antonius's perspective. The book starts out in a high point of action right off the start. We learn that Antonius's father has died. The circumstances of his death are very unfortunate. It seems as though he has died of some sort of illness. Before I get too into the details of the chapter, I want to read the synopsis because I thought that it really conveyed a really interesting story. So let's get to that real quick. For over 2,000 years, Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony, has been one of history's most controversial men. His story was buried with him and written by his enemies. Now his entire saga is revealed in a compelling trilogy by Brooke Allen. After young Marcus Antonius's father dies in disgrace, he yearns to restore his family's honor during the final days of Rome's dying republic. Marcus is rugged, handsome, and owns abundant military talent. But upon entering manhood, he falls prey to the excesses of a violent society. His whoring, gambling, and drinking eventually reap dire consequences. Through a series of personal tragedies, Marcus must come into his own through blood, blades, and death. Once he finally earns a military commission, he faces an uphill battle to earn the respect and admiration of soldiers, proconsuls, and kings. Desperate to redeem his name and carve a legacy for himself, he refuses to let warring rebels, scheming politicians, or even, even an alluring young Egyptian princess stand in his way. Wow, I think that that is really a stunning synopsis for this book, and it is definitely very compelling, very interesting. There's a lot of, there's a little bit of everything in there for everybody, as far as I'm concerned. If you're looking for action, if you're looking for political drama, if you're looking for romance, there's a little bit of all of that in this book. And you can get a little bit of a glimpse of that even in just the first chapter. So as I said earlier, young Mark Antony discovers his father's fate by eavesdropping on a conversation between his mother and his uncle. And in this conversation, they're really not saying very nice things about his father. And there's a little bit of like this weird dichotomy where it seemed as though the mother and the uncle both loved Mark Anthony's father and respected his personality, but didn't respect his, I guess, honor or his professional capacity because he has brought disgrace to the family. Um, he has basically done his job poorly and the Senate has given him a new name to indicate his failures in life. So this quote is from Mark Antony's uncle. I always considered my brother to be among the best of men. Pity he bungled this mission. Sometimes there are sides to men one never sees until they enter politics and war. That's where true character arises. So again, his uncle considers him to be among the best of men, but at the same time, in the same breath, he's insulting his brother's political aspirations and saying that he's bungled this opportunity and that his true character was revealed to be lacking. In this quote, Mark Antony's mother is basically agreeing. Yes, he was kind, but he had no mind for things that make men great. Mama reasoned aloud. So yet again, even Mark Antony's mother is kind of confirming this idea, this kind of cultural notion, I guess, where a man can be a good man while at the same time not being a great man, not being an honorable man. 
And that's a really interesting thing to read about and to feel immersed in, because even though these ideas seem contradictory in some ways, you get a sense that it, it makes sense from, from their cultural perspective. In this quote, we see how the Senate has decided to deal with Mark Anthony's father's death. The session ended with everyone demanding to know why he hadn't committed suicide. They declared his illness to be judgment from the gods. They've branded him with a new name, a derisive one, Creticus, man of chalk. This is another example of how well Alan takes the world building and rather than just telling us what the society is like, what kind of things they value, showing us through the dishonor of Mark Anthony's father's actions, just how this society will deal with people who fail to, I guess, increase the, the glory of Rome. So if you fail in your job, not only have you failed, it doesn't matter that you've died, they'll drag your entire family's name through the mud. And so they name him Creticus, man of chalk, because basically everything that he's done doesn't mean anything. It can be wiped away and undone as easily as you would wipe away chalk. So reflecting on this information that Mark Anthony has learned about his father, his father's death, his father's dishonor, he's reflecting on the situation. And there, this is not uh, really a criticism, but this was something that I was very confused about. This line here, I'm going to pull this up. Marcus rolled onto his back, his leather bulla tumbling onto the cushion next to his cheek. He'd worn the little good luck charm since he was a baby. So right off the back, it's a little good luck charm, and I could just imagine it just being this like small little thing, but I was just curious, what what is a bulla? And there had been a lot of words that have come up in this chapter that I wasn't immediately familiar with, didn't know exactly what they meant, but I, I had read them or heard them in other circumstances. I knew that they were Roman. I could understand what they were. But anyways, I tried to look up online what this was. And I got to say the first few things that showed up on Google images was definitely not what Alan intended. But when I threw in Roman bulla, I saw that it was like a little like circular trinket of some sort. Um, again, not a criticism. I just didn't know what it was. And I thought it was kind of funny when I pulled up an image search, I got some vaguely sexual results. This line, very simple, but I thought that it was really cool and just kind of gave me this, this sense of like the great story that I was about to read. Tata died in shame, but his son would rise in courage. So this is from Mark Anthony's perspective, and this is how he feels, this is how he's reconciling the situation. Yes, his father has died in shame, but he would redeem the family name. He was going to rise in courage and do something great with his life. And I thought that that really stood out and was a really interesting line, a very well-written line. Towards the end of the story, Mark Anthony brings his younger brother to talk with his mother and his uncle, and they discuss his father's death and his father's disgrace. And Mark Anthony's mother says something very interesting to him. And again, I want to keep harping on this point because I do think that Alan did this so well in this chapter. This is another example of how thoroughly done the world building is in this chapter and how immersive it is. Consider this a lesson, my sons. Never, ever bring humiliation to your family. For now, we'll all pay for his, his mistakes. Disgrace is worse than death. It's internal shaming that men in the Senate never forget. So that really speaks volumes to what this world is like, what this culture is like, and what Mark Anthony's family values, and the the extent to which he is going to have to work hard to redeem his family name. It seems as though, even though they have just found out this terrible information, even though they are going to grieve for his father, the thing that everyone is talking about, the thing that everyone is most focused on, is honor. And the, the danger that the family is in now that their honor is being called into question. By the end of the chapter, this is what Mark Anthony feels about his father. He suddenly realized he wasn't grieving for loss of life, but instead he was crying because he no longer knew how he felt about Tata, his father, and now he'd never see him again. My understanding about 
historical fiction, one of the greatest appeals of it, one of the things that I've enjoyed about it, and the few things that I've read that have been classified as historical fiction, is that you feel as though you are immersed in the world and in the culture. In a lot of ways, it's not too different from fantasy, because this really is a world that is completely different from our own today. Um, it existed in the past, so it was historical reality, but it's it's not our current reality. So in some ways, it lines up really well with what I'm most familiar with, which is probably fantasy. To that point, I think Alan does a tremendous job of building this world, of immersing us in this culture, of giving us a sense of what the protagonist is going to value, what he is going to aspire to accomplish, and what we can expect from the book moving forward. I think that this book and this series has a tremendous amount of potential based on what little I've read of it. I would definitely keep reading if I was going to decide based on the first chapter, would I continue reading this or not? I absolutely would. I probably will. I think that Mark Anthony's character is interesting. I think that the world is very interesting. I want to learn more about it. Based on the synopsis, there is a lot to expect. So yes, if you are a fan of historical fiction of any kind, especially if you are interested in ancient history, I would absolutely recommend this book for you. I think everybody should give it a shot. It's available on Kindle Unlimited. If you've enjoyed this review and you're curious about my own writing, I write epic fantasy. My book, The Reaping of Xanadu, is available on Kindle Unlimited. I just released it about a month ago, so you can check that out if you want to support me. Thank you for watching, and hopefully I will be uploading again soon. Thank you.